I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or the Uversion Bible app, as always, in the live events section there. Uh, you can find the notes and scripture for today, uh, as well as if you're using one of the Bibles in the rack in front of you. It's on page 957. 957, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I remember a, a whole lot of things. Um, we lived at the, uh, at this particular time I'm going to tell you about, we lived in a little city called Cleburne, Texas. Uh, uh, at that time, it was, it was little. It's a lot different now. A major highway went through there now, and it's completely different. They have an Applebee's. I mean, uh, you know, so it, 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 it has hit the big time, I guess. I they have a Walmart now, so there you go. Uh, Cleburne, Texas is on the map. They got a Walmart. Uh, but back then, it was a completely different place, no Walmart. Um, but I can remember a lot of things about that city from when I was a little kid. Uh, but I distinctly remember the first day that uh, Dad took me out and showed me the lawnmower. And he let me go out and mow the yard. And I say, let me, it was more like, hey, you're going to mow the yard. Uh, and he said, this is why I had children, uh, to do the dishes and to do the yard. I said, thank you, Dad. It makes me feel loved. Uh, and so he, he took me out, showed me the mower. I was in second grade. Uh, that stands out of my head. Uh, but he didn't tell me after I had done it the first time that on that mower there was a lever that pushed it for you. That was a self-propelled mower. So I'm out there as a second grader, almost prostrate on the ground out there trying to push this thing in our yard. Uh, it took me quite a, few, uh, quite a while. Uh, Mom was up on the porch watching me the whole time that I didn't slip and fall and get chopped up. But uh, I can remember as a second grader starting to mow the yard. And Caleb's, okay, there we go. He, he's good. About time that boy learned to mow the yard. <laughs> it's a little bit different now uh, than it was then. The mower's quite a bit bigger than it was then. Um, but, you know, as that became my weekly responsibility, uh, mowing the yard, and in Cleburne, uh, as here, you know, we had winter time, and so the yard would die. Uh, well, when I was in fifth grade, we moved to Houston. And now there's no winter in Houston. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's very hot. It's very humid, and the grass grows all the time. Uh, and so we're down there, and so I had to learn <clears throat> that the grass was really only dormant for about a month, from mid-December to mid-January, and it was growing the rest of the year. Uh, and so it was my responsibility to mow the yard every single week. Well, uh, as I got older and became a teenager, I know none of the teenagers that, that you know are like this, but I tried to figure out how to do the least amount of work. Um, and uh, so I had it in my head a variety of ways. I would try to mow it as fast as possible so I could get it done quickly and get back in the house where it was cooler and I could watch TV. Uh, you know, I had my little Walkman. Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the Walkman. It, I mean, I was a minister's kid, so it was an off-brand Walkman. And I had my uh, DC Talk free at last cassette tape, pop it in there, and I'd be jamming out, to, you know, DC Talk going down the yard and doing my thing. Uh, but there was this one time I got it in my head. You know what? I hate mowing the yard every two weeks. I, I, I don't like it. It's not fun to get home from school or, or you know, get done with school. And uh, after you're done with school, you, you, you're there and you just want to veg out. You know, as a teenager, you always want to veg out. You want to veg out when you're doing school. But uh, I, I got done with school and I just wanted to not do anything. But it was, you know, the yard had to be mowed. Dad told me yesterday, I've got to mow it today. And so done with school, I go out and I mow the yard. <clears throat> well, I thought, you know what? I'm tired of mowing this every week. I'm just going to knock this down a couple notches so it'll be lower and it won't grow as fast. Uh, and so I get out there with the mower, um, uh, and, you know, you click the notches, and it drops down, and I click it back into place. I'm like, oh, that looks low enough. I'll take care of this. And I'm going, and it's, uh, this is hard. Why is this so difficult? And I go one row, and I come back the second row, and I look back and realize, hey, there's no grass there anymore. That was not the best idea. Um, so I kick it back up a couple notches and then wait a few hours for Dad to get home <laughs> and realize... Um, I'm going to have to do a little more work besides uh, simply mowing this every week. Uh, you see, I was trying to get by with doing just some of the work or the, or the least amount of work possible, even though I wanted all the results. Yeah, I, we still wanted the yard to look good, and yeah, I still wanted that, but I just didn't want to work at it that hard. I didn't want to do as much. wanted all the results, but only do some of the work. And we're going to see the Apostle Paul address some of this today in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, this, this attitude of, of doing some but wanting all. Paul is going to get right to the heart of that matter. You see, here in 1 Corinthians, as we've seen a few times over the past several weeks, 
uh, this church in the city of Corinth, Paul founded it. He started it simply telling a few people about Jesus. A bunch of them got saved, started a church. Paul stayed there for a while, left, and he wrote a few letters back to that church addressing some of the issues that were going on there. Uh, but here in 1 Corinthians 9, he is going to get to the heart of the matter. He is going to get down to what his purpose is, why he exists, and why every single person in that church exists. Uh, go down to 1 Corinthians 9, uh, starting in verse 16. Paul writes, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Now right off the bat, we need to understand what Paul's talking about when he says preach the gospel. Uh, he's not necessarily talking about standing up in front of people behind a pulpit, uh, expounding on three points from a sermon. And when, he, when Paul mentions this phrase, preach the gospel, he's simply te- talking about telling people about Jesus. You know, when he walked into town and was going to tell people about Jesus, he didn't bring his, his travel pulpit with him and set it up and, and just start going to town at the pulpit. He's talking about telling people about Jesus. And so when he says, if I preach the gospel, it gives me no ground for boasting. I can't brag about the fact that I tell people about Jesus. Because that next phrase, necessity is laid upon me. He says, I must preach. I I need to tell people about Jesus. I cannot help it. it. It flows out of me. I have to. And now you read that and you say, okay, well, you're Paul, all right? You're the Apostle Paul. You know, you're a professional Christian, greatest missionaries ever existed. You've done all this great stuff. Of course, you have to tell people about Jesus. It's in your very nature. You know, that's why we have a church staff. That's what they do. We pay them to do it. Well, the thing is, though, Paul is more like you than he's like me because Paul was not paid by a church to do what he does. Paul's occupation, Paul's job was a tent maker. He was not on staff at a church. His occupation was, was making tents, and he sold them, and he, as he did that, he went around telling people about Jesus. And now, you know, Paul being a tent maker, having that be his job, uh, uh, that is, though, not how we know him. We don't know him as the tent maker, Paul. We know him as the Apostle Paul, and the the word apostle means one who is sent out with a message. Paul's character, Paul's legacy is known not by his job, but by the fact that he told people about Jesus. How are you known by other people? When you introduce yourself to someone, how do they know you? Hi, my name is such and such, and I do this for my job, or like Paul a tent maker, he doesn't say, hi, my name's Paul, I'm a tent maker. Hi, my name's Paul. Do you know about Jesus? Paul's, Paul's goal was to tell people about Jesus, and his, his job, his occupation afforded him with those opportunities as he went around selling his tents, selling his, his, his wares, what he has worked on with his hands, selling them, but he would use those as opportunities to tell people about Jesus as he went around from place to place selling his tents. It was his, his mission drove his motivation. Not, and his, his motivation was God's motivation, was telling people about Jesus. It wasn't simply to, to get up every morning to get a paycheck. It was to get up every morning to tell people about Jesus. And God would provide the rest and so he says, it was a necessity for me. He cannot help it. He, he needs to do it in the sense, all right, in the, it's a necessity in the sense of uh, breathing is a necessity. You know, we need to breathe. We, we need to. If we don't, we die. If we don't breathe, we don't function. And Paul is saying, as a Christian, as a living Christian, I need to tell people about Jesus. If I don't, then I am not living as a Christian. It is a, it is a necessary part of who I am. He says, I need to. It's a necessity. I cannot help it. And then he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me if I do not tell people about Jesus. And that word woe, it means a, a state of intense hardship or difficulty. It means disaster or horror. Paul is saying, may my entire world come crashing down around me if I don't tell people about Jesus. 
It says, it's, it's part of me. It's part of, part of who I am. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says that it kind of spills out of his response to Christ. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for their sake and was raised. He says our response to God, uh, God sending Jesus to die and raise from the dead, our response is a love that we allow to control us, a love that we allow to, to direct our paths, direct our actions, and us going out and telling people about Jesus should be a natural part of that. As Paul calls it, a necessity. He cannot help but do it. Now look at verse 17. Paul writes, For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. And so having just gotten done saying that, that him telling people about Jesus is a necessity, something he has to do, he's compelled to do it, uh, he cannot help but do it. He says, if I did it of my own will, if I made a decision to consciously do it, okay, give me an award, all right, telling people about Jesus. Remember, in the same sense of breathing. You know, if you consciously tell yourself to breathe every second of every day, I'll give you an award. That's pretty impressive. If you're over there thinking, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. But then, oh, I forgot. Uh, you, if you're telling yourself to do that all of the time, that is quite a feat of discipline. But Paul is saying, me telling people about Jesus isn't a feat of discipline. It, it, it is a necessity. It is a part of who I am. It just, just, just happens. I can't stop it. It just happens. Just like us breathing just happens. We cannot uh, uh, help but breathe. Paul says, for the Christian, we should not be able to help but tell people about Jesus, but have it be an overflow. I've mentioned the story before. I don't know if many of you have heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, phenomenal choir uh, at a phenomenal church up in New York. I knew a guy who went to see him one time, uh, and this, the, the, the entire choir, you know, I mean, it's a couple hundred members large. Uh, all of them paid for their airfare, and they were doing a, a, a tour around the country singing at uh, different places. And my friend went to go see him. And uh, after the concert, they were mingling uh, among everybody who came and talking to him. And my friend, he talked to about 10 or 15 of them. And every single one, without fail, within 90 seconds of the start of the conversation, had brought it back to Jesus. Every one of them. From the soloist to, to the bassist in the back who's only pretending to sing and just saying watermelon. All of them brought the conversation back to Jesus. And it just floored him. That that was just an overflow of who they are. They could not help but bring it back to Jesus. So Paul says, I'm entrusted with a stewardship. I've been given this responsibility of the gospel. You know, the gospel isn't something that you get and keep. It's something that you are given and you give away. If you're not giving it away, then you're not uh, uh, fulfilling the purpose of it having been given to you in the first place. You're not supposed to hold on to it. You're supposed to pass it along so someone else can enjoy it as well as you have and reap the same benefits that you have. It's a, it's a stewardship. It's a responsibility. Look at verse 18. So what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So what is the reward of sharing the gospel? Paul says it there. The reward is the gospel. The reward is the gospel that I might share or that I might present the gospel free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel. He says the reward is the gospel. The reward is being able to, to share the gospel. It's being able to tell somebody about Jesus, getting to, to see them accept Christ, see them grow in Christ, see Christ transform who they are. The reward is the obedience uh, in Christ. Because remember, the very last words of Jesus before he physically left this earth or go and tell people about me. Go and make disciples. Go and be my witnesses. And so Paul is taking that to heart. He's going out there as he does his job tent making, and he is telling people about Jesus, accepting the reward as the gospel. But an issue comes up sometimes is we know that we need to do this. 
I mean, Scripture says it. Do it. Tell people about me. Uh, and we know we need to. But whether by our actions or our genuine overflow of our heart, a lot of times we don't want to. You know, we want to do, get our stuff done, uh, go, you know, uh, go to Walmart, get our stuff, hit that self-checkout because we don't want to talk to anybody and uh, get out of there and get on with our business uh, and not thinking about maybe a checker who needs to know about the rescuing power of Jesus, not thinking about somebody else who might need Christ. And we think about us and we, we don't want to tell people. I mean, they're going to think we're weird. I mean, we're telling them about something spiritual and they just want to take care of something physical and we don't want to go there and it's an awkward situation. And come on, I don't want to tell people about that even though we know we need to, according to Christ. The thing is, we've got to line up our want to and our need to. And with the gospel, your want to and your need to align when you see there, don't get to. Because if you don't tell them about Jesus, they don't get to go to heaven. They don't get to experience Christ, the peace and the power and the love and, and, and everything that comes from having a relationship with the Creator. They don't get to experience that if we don't tell them about Jesus. And, and if we genuinely understood the massive implications of that, just them knowing Christ, having eternity in heaven, we would have this same uh, realization Paul does here and not being able to, to stop it, that telling people about Jesus would be like breathing. It would just flow out of us. We couldn't help it. Our need to and our want to would coincide. They would be united. And uh, their, those unbelievers, their not get to, would transform into a can't wait. Now look at verse 19. <clears throat> Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. He's going to start a very interesting section here. As he says there, uh, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. This particular culture, this Greek culture, this Roman culture, uh, was driven by these two ideas, one being a servant, a slave, and one being, uh, having, uh, uh, being a possessor of freedom, being free. Uh, and uh, uh, these two different classes of people, they existed in the culture. There were servants, there were slaves, and there were people who were free, Roman citizens who were free. And if you were a servant, you were constantly working to gain your freedom. If you were free, then no one could tell you to do anything because you were free. You had freedom, you were a possessor of it, and anyone who would seek to take away your freedom, you had the right to stop them because you're free. And so now here's Paul. Introducing this idea to these people in Corinth, saying, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. He says, I am willingly giving up my freedom that I might win more of them. Speaking of salvation. He says, I'm giving up any freedom I have if it means more people coming to know Christ. And he gives us examples. Verse 20. He says, To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And now this verse is very interesting considering the fact that Paul has worked for years to dispel the misconception that people coming to know Christ had to obey a whole bunch of rules once they came to know Christ. Because the first believers were Jews. Uh, because that's, Jesus was a Jew, he came among the Jews, and once they saw Jesus die and raise from the dead, they came to know Christ. And what ended up happening is when Gentiles, non-Jews, started believing in Jesus and getting saved, the Jews said, okay, you're going to get saved, you've got to obey all these rules that, that, that we have to obey, uh, having been cultural Jews. You, you can't eat these things, you've got to dress this way, you've got to go do this, you can't do those things on Saturday, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. And uh, Paul worked very, very hard to help the church understand you can't put those rules on them. The gospel isn't about doing these things. It's about believing in Jesus. They had a big meeting in the city of Jerusalem, and Acts chapter 15 goes into it. And all the apostles get up, and they tell everybody, you can't be putting all these rules on them. You're saying the gospel is about believing in Jesus and all of this stuff. It's not about that. It's just believing in Jesus. And so Paul... Uh, uh, 
spent a lot of time trying to get people to understand it's not about following those rules. But now he comes in here in verse 20, and he says, I'm willing to go back and obey those rules if it means that those people have the opportunity to hear the gospel. I'm willing to go back and stop eating bacon and and dress a certain way and, and not do such and such on that day of the week so that those people will listen to me and they might have the opportunity to know Jesus. If it means even other people who weren't Jews but have placed themselves under the law, they have have, uh, been uh, uh, converted to Judaism, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to to follow that Jewish law if it means telling more people about Jesus. Now, Paul's not saying that he's going to violate biblical principles or go against Scripture or do something sinful. He's saying that in my my Christian freedom, I don't have to do those things because uh, uh, the Old Testament was fulfilled in Christ. I don't have to follow, you know, especially those, those laws that were made up by the religious leaders. I don't have to follow any of that. But he says, I'm willing to do it if it means they uh, will listen to the gospel. And then he goes on. He says the opposite. Verse 21. And to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And so whereas before he said, I will follow the law to the letter and do all that stuff just that they might hear the gospel. Now he says, now to these over here who have no idea what the law is and they're out here and they're lawless and and they're doing all kinds of stuff, I'm willing to go out there with them. Now, again, he's not willing to sin. He's not willing to to step over the line of what God desires of him. But he's willing to go over here and do everything that that it takes, short of sin, to tell them about Jesus. He's willing to follow the law. He's willing to go over here and accept their culture if it means telling them about Jesus. He says, because the gospel is what's important. The gospel, not my freedom to eat a certain thing, not my freedom to do a certain thing on a certain day. The, the, the important thing is the gospel. And then he gives us another one. Verse 22. He says, To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. Now, what's interesting about that, you know, in these previous two, two verses, you know, he's talking about Jews and he's talking about people who weren't Jews. And now here he talks about the weak. And what makes that so interesting is that in the v- previous chapter, chapter 8, he talks about the weak. And the weak, in that context, he's talking about weak Christians. Christians who are weak in their faith. And so whereas he's willing to, according to verse 20 and 21 go into the culture of the Jews, go into the culture of the Gentiles in order that they might hear the gospel, in order they might come to Christ. Here he's saying he's willing to give up some of his freedom in order to bring the weak believer closer to Christ. Whatever that means, whatever that means giving up, whatever that means uh, 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 walking along with them, again, short of sin, it, that they might come closer to Christ. Because their relationship with Christ, according to Paul, is more important than his own desires and preferences. Maybe going to see certain kinds of movies. Maybe uh, uh, the way you talk. Maybe drinking alcohol. Maybe anything. Is anything in your life worth more than someone else knowing about Jesus? Paul is saying, no. I'll give it all up. All of it. I mean, having grown up as a Jew and then uh, uh, after that trying to, to uh, uh, share the gospel with Gentiles, undoubtedly he probably at some point ate pork and realized how great bacon is and, and, and the, the gift of God that it is. Uh, but he's saying, I'm willing to give that up if that means going back to those Jews and telling them about Jesus. I'm willing to give up whatever it takes to tell more people about Jesus. And look at that last sentence there in verse 22. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might win some. Did you notice he says something a lot in that verse? He says the word all three times. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. He's saying, I'm willing to give all to gain some. Give all to gain some. A lot of the times we have it backwards. You know, like I mentioned earlier, we want to give some to gain all. 
Now, I've got some guys who are going to come and help me. I got an illustration this morning. They're going to bring some things on the stage for me. Uh, be in prayer for them. Uh, a couple of them are quite heavy. Uh, but um, we want to give some to gain all a lot of times in our attitudes and in our lives and uh, in, in the things that, that we think about. Uh, there was a, I, I told this story a year and a half ago on a Wednesday night. Uh, there was a time when, uh, good job guys, I'm very impressed, very impressed. That counts for your week's workout right there. Um, uh, there was a time, and you know, you watch the commercials on TV and you see people doing the exercise things. You're like, man, that is, they look great. They, they look. There's that one dude, he's, he's in his mid-50s and he looks 50 times better than I do. I mean, how in the world is it, are they doing this? Uh, and so there was this one workout program that I wanted to try and my friend had it. So I borrowed it. It takes 90 days to do the whole thing. All right, I can do that. Whatever. You need to do something for 90 days. You can commit to it. So you pop the DVDs in and you're, you're doing it and it takes uh, a, a while. It's like an hour a day. Uh, and so I go through week one, you know, it, you know, the commercial tells you you're supposed to, you're going to feel better. You're going to look better and everything's going to be better in your life. Wow. I mean, of course I want that. Uh, and so you go and you try it. Day one goes by, whew, you know, ruin that shirt, uh, sweating so much and getting out there. And, uh, you know, but I feel good. All right, good, great. Get through the w- first week, get to that rest day. And, you're, you're, you know, <laughs> throughout the week, you're begging for that rest day. And it comes and uh, hit week two. And it's a little bit harder on week two. I uh, get to week three, okay, but I'm not exactly feeling less tired than I was before. I'm feeling more tired than I was before. And I'm not seeing... I don't look like that dude on the commercial. What's going on? Hit week four. You get about halfway through week four, and I'm thinking, all right, something's wrong. All right, I'm doing exactly what they're doing on that DVD, and I feel a lot more tired, and uh, I am not looking anything like what they say I need to be looking at by this point. Uh, And so I started doing a little research, and I realized, uh, you know, I didn't read the packet. I'm a guy. You don't read the instructions. Uh, And so I, I, I did a little research, and I discovered... That in order to get the results, to, to feel the way they want you to feel, look the way they want you to feel, you got to eat a certain way. I don't know if you knew that. you got to give up some things when you eat if you, you know, whatever. Uh, and so I, I, I discovered I had to, to give up cheese, um, ice cream, chips, and this was the deal breaker, creamer in my coffee. I said, well, I guess I don't want to look like that person that bad. <laughs> uh, and uh, you see, what, what, what was happening is I really wanted to gain all of the results, but only have to give it some of the effort. You know, what's, what's really cool about these particular weights right here is they've got these dials on the side that you can dial in any particular weight from 10 pounds up to 90 pounds, which with the base is 100 pounds. So those guys were lifting 100 pounds. That's pretty impressive, right? Anyway, uh, and so you can dial in, you know, and if you're working out, you can work out doing all kinds of things. You can pick up like a 45-pound weight. Like, oh, man, yeah, 45 pounds, I'm working out. But then you realize, you know, that's kind of hard. I don't really want to give it that much effort. You know, I'm going to come over here. Let's, uh, let's crank that puppy on down. There we go, 10 pounds. All right, man, I am feeling good. Okay, I'm good. That's enough for now. Uh, and, and we want to give it some of the effort. We want to put in some of what we think we need to do, but we want all of the results. We want to look like the people on the commercial. We want to feel like they say we got to feel like. We want to do all of that, but we don't want to put in all of the effort. I mean, come on, given all of the effort, there's no way I want to want to put in that much time and commit that much that much work to it. I want the life I want to have. I want to eat my chips. I want to eat my bluebell. Now that we got it back, praise God. Uh, I want to um, have coffee in my creamer because that's the way it's going to be in heaven. I want to have all of these things, and I don't want to put in that much effort to get those kind of results. And Paul here, though, is saying the exact opposite. You know, whereas we, a lot of times, whether by our actions, by our physical actions, by our thoughts, by our words, we put in some of the effort expecting all of the results. Paul says the opposite. He says, no, I want to put in all of the effort expecting just some of the results. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Give it all, give it everything I've got to the Jews, to the Gentiles. Every waking moment, 
Even as I'm making my tents, getting ready to go out and sell them, every waking moment, I want to give it my all for the express purpose that more people might come to know Jesus. Just that some might come to know Jesus. And then we get to the point of the whole thing, verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Everything Paul does is for the sake of the gospel. Remember, he said earlier, the the reward of the gospel is the gospel. Here he says to share in their blessings. I, I, uh, I'm doing everything for the sake of the gospel. There's no other reason. There's no other motivation. Uh, you know, a lot of times in our lives, we have uh, uh, many mixed motivations. We may feel like we are pure in our motivations about a particular thing, but there is something there that is diluting our motivations. It is diluting our drive to accomplish something. When it came to doing that 90-day exercise for me, it, what was diluting my drive was the sugar and the goodness of the food. Uh, a lot of things dilute our drive and our motivations to accomplish something particular. And Paul is saying, no, for him, it's all about the gospel. Everything is about the gospel because a a diluted drive misses the blessings. A diluted drive misses the blessings. Paul says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Be a partaker of the obedience. Be a partaker of witnessing them in their changed life. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. You know what? We're going to hit one more verse. Look at verse 24. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Run that you may obtain it. You know, this idea of running a race... I mean, it was rampant in the Greek culture with the Olympic Games, but particularly very near where this church was, there was uh, a form of the Olympic Games. It wasn't obviously the Olympic Games, but it was the next step down was held right near where this church was. And so Paul talking about racing, the races were the big part of those games, and he says uh, they would see the, the racers out all the time training. That was their life, was about the training, was about doing everything in their life to train for that race, to achieve uh, uh, the first place in that race. And he says, you know, in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. And so he takes this idea of a physical race and transfers it to the spiritual implications of running a spiritual race telling people about Jesus. Run that you may obtain the prize. Do your best. Give it your all. You know, you don't need to run your day as though your life depends on it. You need to run as though their life depends on it because it does. Run as though their life depends on it. Paul did. Paul, who was not a a career minister, that was not his job. But he made it his life's goal to tell people about Jesus in everything, every aspect, because it was all about Jesus. If that meant losing that person's business, fine, because it's about Jesus, not about making money on the tent. It's about Jesus. Do it all for the sake of the gospel. Because when you get down to it, as a believer, knowing Christ, what is the purpose for your life? Why are you here? Why do you have the job you have? According to Paul, the gospel Why do you have the spouse you have? The gospel. Why do you have the kids you have? The gospel. Why do you have the friends you have, the acquaintances that you have? The gospel. Why do you have breath in your lungs? The gospel. Are you accomplishing your purpose in life? Why are you here? Getting a paycheck, getting the money, paying the bills, having a good life, having your preferences accomplished? Or would you rather be like Paul, giving your all for the sake of the gospel? Because one day this here will end. Working out won't matter anymore. Praise Jesus. We'll be in heaven. And we'll realize 
that a lot of the things we spent time on here in the grand scheme of eternity, in 2,000 years from now when we're having a good time in heaven, are we really going to care about the thing we care about today? Or will we care about the gospel? We need to transition our ideas of, of why we are here and what's our purpose to God's purpose and what Paul did. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. And now if you're here in this room and you know, you've heard about the gospel before, you've heard about Jesus before and, and you know about some of those things, but if you've never genuinely implanted that concept in your heart, it's been a head knowledge thing. Oh, yeah, I, I know G about Jesus and all that, whatever. But if you've never genuinely believed it, make today your day. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't go till this afternoon or tomorrow. Take care of it today. Believe in Jesus now. His death and his resurrection in your place, paying for every single one of your sins, your mistakes, your disobedient actions, your bad attitudes, he forgave it all if you simply believe that he came and died and rose from the dead. Believe in the gospel. And this needs to become such an important part of who we are as individual Christians that we are implanting it into who we are as a church. I don't know if you've noticed, but there is a tree that has been painted on our wall. It's in the process of being painted on our wall out there. It is bare. It looks cool, bare, but it's, it's out there. And what we're going to do is as you come to church each Sunday... Here in this room, uh, we're going to have leaves. It looks just like this, leaves. And on the other side, it says, I shared the gospel. And as each and every one of us begin to absorb the truth of what Paul is saying here, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. What we want you to do is every Sunday, take one of these leaves as you come in the room and put it in the offering plate if you have shared the gospel that week. Every time you share the gospel, for every person you have shared the gospel with, take that many leaves and put it in the offering plate. And then as the offering plate is passed and, and somebody down the row sees, hey, look, there's three leaves in there. They're encouraged by that. And then as you come to church the next Sunday and you see, hey, look, there's seven more leaves on the tree. More and more people telling more and more people about Jesus. In addition to that, when somebody comes to know Jesus, we've got these apples. And on the reverse side, it says, I believe. Every time somebody comes to know Christ, we're going to put one of these on the tree. And we're going to spend our year filling that tree out with the gospel. Because that's what it's all about. It's about the gospel. And so we're going to have those. And every Sunday you're going to have the opportunity to take those, put them in the offering plate. Using your, your gift of, of telling somebody about Jesus as an offering to the Lord. I'll tell this person about Jesus. I will follow you. I will, I will do my best to imitate what Paul is saying here, that in all things, at all times, by all means, I will uh, uh, make the gospel the center of my life because doing it all for the sake of the gospel is what life is all about. And so in a moment, after I pray, if you don't know the gospel, if you have yet to believe in Jesus, come to the front and talk to us, and we'll take care of that issue now, and you never have to worry about it again for the rest of your life. You will be saved, you will be rescued, and you will have uh, uh, Jesus' stamp on your heart, and you get to enjoy heaven instead of pain and punishment. Or... If you know Jesus, if you know the gospel, and you need to work on your heart to transition yourself to have this kind of attitude, 1 Corinthians 9, 20, what was that? 23, doing it all for the sake of the gospel and shifting how we understand what our life is about, then take this time during this next song and offer yourself up to the Lord. God, I want to change. I want to move my life from... from trying to do some to doing all in your name for the sake of the gospel. Because in light of eternity, that is what matters. So each and every one of us, whether we need to know Jesus or we need to offer our lives in telling others about him for the sake of the gospel, all of us have a decision to make after this prayer.